Welcome to our panel discussion, Digital Identity, the Catalyst for Inclusive Financial Services. Our panelists today are Professor Xiaoyan Jiang, Associate Dean of PBC School of Finance at Tsinghua University, Professor Marcos Zachariadis, FinTech and Information Systems Chair at Alliance Manchester Business School, and Santiago Fernandez de Lee, Head of Regulation at BBVA. Infosys President Mohit Joshi will provide closing remarks. I'm Jeff Cavanaugh, Head of the Infosys Knowledge Institute and moderator for today's discussion. This idea for digital identity came from, well, it's a, it's a long-standing need, but it really came together last year with the white paper that Mohit wrote for the World Economic Forum on the need for digital identity. What we wanted to do today is dig into this very important concept, especially coming out of COVID. We wanted to start with the first question that might be the obvious one. Why is a digital ID important? And Xiaoyang, could you start, maybe give your perspective? Uh, to me, digital ID is a infrastructure for a modern society, especially after 2020 pandemic situation. So here, I, I think digital ID is a identification that is needed for uh, all commercial activities and, you know, every individual and uh, every organization would need a digital ID. And we think that this digital ID can improve efficiency and reduce cost. For instance, you know, uh, when we have a identification that is digital that can easily recognized by the government, by uh, the sellers, and by anybody on the supply chain, that is going to be so much more efficient. And especially when we are post in the post-pandemic era, uh, when we have a digital identification, we don't have to, you know, we. We don't have to be in physical contact, uh, contact for any real economic uh, activities necessarily. I mean, we just, um, I think the, the, we can streamline the relations between the government, individuals, firms, organizations. So to me, again, let me summarize. I think a digital ID is important because it's infrastructure for, it can be an infrastructure and we hope it can be infrastructure for the real economic activities all around. Thank you. It's interesting you mentioned the infrastructure part and then the fact that it's for relationships because digital actually being more human is a very interesting connection. Thank you. Marcos, sure. what, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think I'll, I'll have obviously had to agree with Chayanne. Um, you know, obviously, this ID can be very central in the economy. I mean, everybody has to have some kind of ID to be able to transact um, in, in some shape and form. Uh, not in every context, but in many contexts in the formal in the formal economy, it is needed. And it's kind of needs to be seen as a utility. Everybody has to have access to it. And it and it should be an infrastructure that is, is um, fully accessible if somebody wishes to access it. Now, we, we've done a bit of research on, on identification infrastructures. There's a long literature in information systems and economics, actually, on information infrastructures. But our research focused more on the identification infrastructures and the idea of data within. And we've identified a couple of characteristics that identification infrastructures have. So we start, for example, um, from linkability. So linkability is for us the concept through which many different um, databases, external databases that are present in different parts of the economy, for example, or organizations, link to identification infrastructures. So this is one of the important elements that makes identification infrastructures quite important in this, in this particular setting. And the other is pivotality, which I think it's kind of the network externality of identification infrastructures, which means that these infrastructures become even more important the more databases and the more functionality is linked to them. And that has obviously uh, provides a lot of um, uh, benefits to organizations that are linked to the people who are named within the identification infrastructure, but also poses certain risks, which I'm hoping we can discuss a bit later. For example, if you're identified wrong, in, uh, as an organization or entity in this identification infrastructure. That means that everybody else who's linked on this infrastructure will get you wrong. So then the idea of data quality on identification infrastructure becomes very important as well. So I think that's you know, just a couple of examples of how identification infrastructures are, are really important in that sense. 
It's fascinating the fact that this this linking, this interoperability, is a part of it. Santiago, what about uh, that word interoperability, especially coming from from academia uh, and, and, and the banking industry? What's your take on interoperability, and how is this important? Yeah, I think it is it is, it is a crucial element of uh, of all this debate. I very much agree with uh, both Xiaoyan and, and Marcos. So I think global lock lockdowns demonstrated the need for 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 digital id that uh, is trusted and, un and universally accepted for many things for shopping for e-commerce for finance and dealing with uh, the government i mean so many many day-to-day -day activities the problem is that we have a very fragmented landscape as regards uh, digital ID, we have uh, an, 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 a lack of information standards. So we have different tools, national, government, private sector, uh, banks. We have uh, providers, big techs are providers of digital ID. And then across sectors, we have uh, I mean, banking or, or e-commerce or, or payments. I mean, we have a very a uh, diverse and fragmented uh, landscape of, of digital ID. And the key problem is the lack of interoperability of many of these of these systems, of many of these tools. And, uh, and those, that, that's why uh, I think a key uh, requisite for any really user-friendly and efficient digital ID system would be to put together all these different uh, mechanisms, and uh, there is a particular question on the on the government. And part of the problem lies in many uh, countries in the the absence of a, of a efficient uh, mechanism for uh, digital connection with with the government, and, and there is a lot of uh, red tape in many in many countries. And then there is a, an additional problem when it comes to cross-border uh, use of the, of the uh, digital ID. So that's why I think interoperability should be uh, one of the big uh, objectives of any uh, debate on, on, on how to improve the, the current state of things. It's interesting how each of you brought in a different perspective. You've got the relationship and this infrastructure, it's got to be linked. And this last piece, you said government and, and governance as well, and it just this, this interoperability pulling it together. Um, you mentioned why it's important. Why don't we peel it back a little extra and say, what actually is it? Because it sounds uh, deceptively simple. Uh, I'll start with uh, Shaozhan. What, what do you define digital identity to be? Mm -hmm. Um, it's digital identification. Well, you can think about it as a sequence of numbers and symbols that can identify a person or an organization uniquely. Meaning that, you know, every person in this world probably can have, for digital ID wise, they should have a unique identification. And this particular string of symbols and numbers that represent this person or this organization. And, you know, that's the surface of digital ID. But to me, in my imagination, I'm thinking this digital ID should be easily authenticated. Okay, so for instance, you want to use this digital ID to open a bank account. Then the bank can, if using this ID, can quickly identify who you are, maybe find out your credit history, and so on and so forth. It should be authenticated. Um, so that's very important. So people need to uh, make a transactions with trust. So this digital ID, when you are behind it, they should be able to identify this is the person and this person connecting with this ID. This whole thing is authenticated. And finally, I'm also thinking that the digital ID should be able to protect, you know, should be, be able to protect everybody's privacy. You know, I, I look at this symbol, uh, string of symbols and numbers and other things. My data privacy, 
should be protected. You know, for people that shouldn't know my privacy or I didn't give permission to, they shouldn't be able to uh, get my private data. So, so let me summarize. What I'm saying is this needs to be unique. It should be authenticated. That can be used across firms, countries, individuals. And the third, um, it need to be protected. It need to be private in some way. Our data can be prote protected. Yeah. A lot of implications yeah. there, uh, especially <laughs> this idea that of the billions and billions of people, it's it's more unique by being digital than actually losing your humanity. So it's an interesting point to reinforce. Marcos, what about yourself? What's your perspective on it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'll, I'll agree with Cheyenne um, and potentially uh, try and expand this a bit more. I mean, if you if you look at the, the classic literature on, on digital ID, there are usually three elements to it. So identification, where you as a consumer or as an organization, let's say, provide certain information about yourself. Then we have the verification step, which is usually done from the side of the uh, identification infrastructure, which is essentially to validate all these claims uh, with the provision of, uh, for example, official documentation, or again, you know, through linkability, link to other databases that you're you're going to draw all these documentation and, and evidence from. And in the end, there is a very important step, which I think also Sayam kind of meant, is the authentication step, right? So you need some ha some way to link all these information, which is now has been verified um, with with other contexts outside in the real economy, you know, to leverage these what we call usually reference data that lie on these uh, utility identification infrastructure and prove yourself who you are and that you are the person who are claiming to be to transact with others, you know, in the real economy. And that's the authentication step, which I think is it's really, really important. Now, in terms of your question, Jeff, on um, how do you define this ID? I mean, I think these are, you know, three essential, um, I guess, elements of this ID that are a very big part of the definition. But I guess um, a couple of things more that that I'm, I'm hoping we discuss today, but further in later on is, is also the standardization, which has been um, kind of mentioned before. And I think Sean kind of mentioned about this unique identifier. It's really important to be able to to use these uh, expression of the unique identifier across many different parts of the economy. Because now we have, for example, and we end up with different identification infrastructures, and people have all sorts of different unique numbers, which are not necessarily usable um, in an efficient way. So I think, you know, as part of, as a definition goes, I think these are some of the important elements that, that we can use to describe this ID. So, so again, going back to standardization, interoperability, and you keep mentioning that word linkability. So I think the, you know, getting those hooks in there, keep it in there. So, Santiago, what about the jurisdictions and, and what's your take on, on de defining this? Well, I think I have not much to, to add to, to what uh, Shoyan and Marcos have said, but yeah, what are the requirements maybe of, for, for digital ID? You know, it has to be trusted, it has to be universally accepted, and it should be uh, I mean, address to all types of digital users, so be it individuals or firms. And the problems are not only as regards individuals, but also firms sometimes have to face difficulties in, 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 in dealing in digital transactions with, with other parties. Now, and all this should be used for different types of, of counterparties. Uh, government, private firms, uh, e-commerce, and again, an additional requirement would be ideally this to be uh, usable, cross-border, cross-sector. Uh, so, I mean, this is the aspiration we should have, I think, uh, should include all these elements. This is really ambitious, but I think we have to have a clear, clear what what would be the, the kind of the final goal, in order to identify the requirements and the process to to, to go there. It's interesting. Each of you touched on this. Maybe I'll go back to you, Marcos, briefly. We talked about people. What about legal entities? How, how does that fit in with this interoperability as well? Thanks, Jeff. I think. You know, identification infrastructures are different nature. There's, there's different identification infrastructures out there. 
um, as far as legal entities go, I think you you, you know people will have uh, different challenges um, dealing with data within. Uh, for example, the, the the research I mentioned before that we've done the, in the chapter we published as part of the University of Oxford Press um, book recently talked about legal entity identifies and legal entity identification infrastructures. And what we found, which I'm hoping again to discuss a bit later with um, with some of the challenges that we have in identification infrastructures, is that obviously within the organizational and corporate world things change a lot quicker than um than you know at a personal level right so for example your name usually stays the same i mean you have the right you change your name and you, and you can do that and update um you know the different identification infrastructures but that doesn't happen very often right so it's something that probably will happen maybe one time in your life maybe two um, and there is, you know, the, the rest of your characteristics, and of course, you'll change your address and so on and so forth, but your rest of your physical characteristics are less likely to change. In the organizational world, organizations change a lot more, right? So they change their name quite often because of mergers and acquisitions. They change all their characteristics in terms of ownership. They change uh, addresses. They change probably the entire executive board and board directors, uh, you know, very often something we see in the corporate world. So all these things will need to be updated every single time. So then the idea of data quality, coming back to some of the previous discussions, the, the idea of data quality is really important when we speak um, about legal entities. Um, and I think that's where it needs a bit more special care in putting together identification infrastructure and making sure that the data that lies within are, are of good quality to be used. Before we leave the topic, Shoyang, could you also dig a little bit deeper on not just the, Marcos mentioned the quality of data, what about the quantity? How much data should be part of an ID? I mean, should it go into your family history, your, your banking? You know, where should it start and stop? Um, earlier, in our earlier discussions, we talked about, you know, some, you know, for United States, for, you know, you can include some of your birth date, social security numbers, some biological traits mm -hmm. of this person. But, you know, how long is going to be? It's, it's not supposed to be too long. It's going to take too much of storage space. So I'm thinking, Maybe with some of the technological innovations, we can store a reasonable size of digital ID for everybody, every institute on the earth. You know, just you know, there's a blockchain technology, right? It's encrypted, right? So if we can do that for coins, I think we can do that for people and organizations too. It should not be too long. It should not take too much of storage space. It's just, well, if you can uniquely identify the person or the firm, that should be enough. Well, let's, let's move on. And so, so we kind of understand the importance and, and what it is. Let's dive into some real details. Maybe you can make it real. Um, so since you, you're, you're speaking, Xiaoyan, how about some examples from China? You know, what, how have you seen this manifest itself in the real world? Yeah, so I was trying to play with my, I'm not trying to play with my cell phone. I'm trying to get example from my cell phone. Here is my cell phone. And what I'm showing you is a house code um, that's, you know, developed during pandemic. It's called house code. What that means is I input my, uh, well, passport number actually, together with my cell phone number. And this app, which was developed by the government and the private sectors all together. Uh, last year, uh, spring, when the pandemic was spreading, they want to make sure everybody is has been coming from, you know, safe zones, okay? Uh, for instance, some part of China was affected by pandemic very seriously, but a lot of places they were not affected. So they use data, they track everybody's movement, um, so every time you want to go to a restaurant, they want to make sure you didn't come from high risk zones, right? So this mm -hmm. is my digital ID. I go to every restaurant. I have to show them this. OK, so this is a real application for traveling, you know, records for my personal. Um, so if I want to ask for apply for a job, I have to show this. You know, whether I'm eligible, I don't have any, you know, uh, very risky virus on me. And then so um, 
for restaurants, shopping, whether I can travel or not, whether I can get a job or not. A lot of local governments, not a lot, let me be more uh, aggressive. I think that every single local government has some versions of the health code. And the one I'm using is actually from Beijing. Um, it's more used in Beijing and it's accepted in mm -hmm. other places, other provinces. That's one example. This is a this is my digital ID. Basically, I have a, uh, they can scan or don't scan me. Uh, but anyway, I have a barcode. So if people look at this, they know I'm safe. I'm, I, I, I'm green. So that's one example for individual person for my health. They look at this, they know I'm healthy. And then so the other very simple example is in China, um, a lot of again, during last year, during the pandemic period, a lot of provinces uh, the local governments they're worried about individuals and the firms productions and their employment because you know people were locked at home and they worry at, I mean, for high risk places for low risk places you worry about can we open the factories or not so they open this government platform and every enterprise they have a digital id now from this digital id it's all connected to a digital platform so the firms, if they need any stamps from the government, they just submit their applications and the, the, the government already know who they are given the digital ID. They will streamline the process. And then if those firms need workers and if they need capital and they can post their needs on the platform. So the financial institutions and people looking for jobs can find them. And the one last thing about this enterprise code, uh, they also can connect with other firms on the platform using their ID to know who are their upstream and downstream as a supply chain. So that is like a whole network. So that works very well in China. And, and then the most successful province, I believe is called Zhejiang province. So that's my two examples I want to share with everybody. Fascinating. You went private or uh, citizen as well as the corporate. The one thing I wanted to highlight, it wasn't the ID in this case wasn't just who you are, it's where you are and where you've been. It's an interesting uh, balance. Santiago, could you give some uh, lessons for maybe the EU? Well, the EU is, is uh, many things are happening in the recent years and is becoming in a way a global standard setter in a number of areas, including uh, privacy with the global data protection regulation, the GDPR, or uh, open payments or open finance with the so-called PSD2 regulation, Payment Services Directive regulation. So, I mean, in some aspects, Europe is uh, maybe because they have an approach that is inherently cross-border. So in Europe, you have to deal with different countries all the time. So you approach always a cross-border problem. And other in other places, the, the regulation is, is initially uh, domestic. But it is interesting, not in digital ID. I mean, in digital ID, the EU is not, uh, in my view, a front runner, although there are things happening here. The most interesting thing happening here is the, that the EU is precisely trying hard at interoperability, you know, the key word we, we mentioned earlier, because uh, what we have is the so-called EIDAS regulation that is aiming at making, I mean, a, a mutual recognition of the different uh, systems that the different governments have. So this is very interesting. It's very ambitious. It's, it's, a, it's a 2014 regulation that is being revised now. So actually we are expecting this new proposal anytime in May. So it would be next week uh, or, or, or very soon. And uh, as I say, I mean, the, the, the objective is, is very relevant because it, it, it is aiming at this uh, kind of uh, uh, mutual recognition. But implementation has been complicated, slow, and pending on technical aspects. Part of the problem is that there, there is a limited scope here. No, they, they are only aiming at the national identity, so e-government side of the of the problem, if you want, but not the private side of the of the of the ED uh, 
ED infrastructure. And the result would be not better than the sum of the parts. And this is also part of the problem is that the, the, the member states uh, define the terms of access to the online authentication on their own in terms, and they have very different levels of usability of national uh, e-identities. So some countries like uh, Estonia are often used as an example uh, of, of very agile and, and, and very efficient systems. I'm not very familiar with the Estonian case, but uh, from what I, I, I have read, it is, it is true. But in most member states, the process is, is cumbersome and it's not very usable. And actually, I have to mention, I mean, a, a personal experience I had in the last few months in dealing with three different uh, sides of the Spanish administration, my tax authority, social security, and the electoral authority. Where I had to use three different identification uh, mechanisms. For, 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 and, this, and this is all of them with the government. So, I mean, it is clear that we are far from having, say, a thing, and, and two of them, by the way, implied physical presence. So it's quite frustrating. Now, this is, and then if we put together all these procedures in Europe, but the procedures are, in the sense, not very easy to use and, and, and cumbersome, then the result wouldn't be great. So, uh, but in, in any case, there is uh, an ambition here of going farther. And I think uh, probably this, this revision of the EIDAS regulation would, uh, would be uh, a good opportunity. The challenges we, we, we have is basically to maintain the privacy protection and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the security uh, and at the same time, making it more usable. I think that Europe, Europe is a case in which this, this balance has been biased uh, traditionally towards greater emphasis on, on privacy and security and less on usability, so at the expense of usability. And I think we need probably to rebalance. So getting more usability, but not at the expense of privacy protection or, or security, of course, but making it compatible. And then this is something that Europe needs to, 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 to address. This is the first challenge. The second challenge is linking governments with private sector solutions. And I would refer to this uh, later. Uh, uh, and, and then the third is to uh, ensure this interoperability uh, cross-border and cross-sector. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, especially that, that idea of balance, because it isn't that either option, you can't have only privacy or only the usability, but I think the balance between. Marks, I'm really fascinated to hear from you about Greece, because while well, it may not be a financial powerhouse worldwide, there's some very interesting things going on in that country related to ID. Could you share those? Yeah, absolutely. Just as a um, you know, one of the many examples, I mean, Santiago also mentioned a few of the things that are happening across the EU and EIDAS, of course, is, is uh, development for a while now. Um, but at the national level, you know, in the Greek context, the government recently released what they called EKYC system, um, which for me takes all the boxes of identification infrastructure as we just defined it in the beginning of the call. And I think it's very um, you know, it's, it's a very unique solution that will potentially bring a lot of efficiencies. It's nothing too sophisticated. And of course, we have seen similar examples, um, for example, across across Europe. But, you know, it, it just gives you the ability to authenticate yourself in different contexts in the real economy. For example, if you go to the bank and open a bank account in Greece, you typically need to provide a huge amount of documentation to prove uh, to the bank who you are. Um, you know, in terms of addresses, ID, and so on and so forth, you know, the tax documentation, etc. Now, all these documents, of course, are, you know, also part of the centralized kind of government database that hold the information about you. So the government put together an EKYC solution where in the context of a bank, for example, you can authenticate yourself and then have the bank directly fetch all these documents from the central kind of the government depository. And that, you know, it sounds simplistic, but in the context of Greece, I think it's quite revolutionary. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm surprised that it hasn't been kind of uh, 
really flagged as a, as a major development in the banking sector. It has been absolutely been referred to from the media and everything. But the thing is, you know, uh, thinking about Greece as a as a country in the European Union that is not, um, you know, vastly developed as other countries we've seen in, the, in the Western Europe, for example. I think that's a major development as far as EID kind of goes. What's amazing, it shows that no matter what the size of the country or the, or the perception, with, with technology, if you're innovative, you can make a huge impact. And I think we're, we're seeing that. A quick example uh, for, from India, uh, the Adar uh, initiative was, a, was a, a digital ID, if you want to call it that. I want to highlight it because it's kind of a, a leaning towards this challenge as well about fairness and digital divide because hundreds of millions of people just didn't have a presence. They didn't exist you know, outside of their physical world. And beyond uh, commerce, the ability to get transfer payments, the open accounts, and basically take part in the digital world. Um, and I think uh, our, our company, Infosys, is part, part of that, especially from our founder, Nanda Nilakani. And it's really interesting because the fraud aspects, the, uh, the governance aspects are so important, and the ability to implement something that isn't just in the high, high-rise office towers of an urban center, but out there in the villages and in and, and ways that uh, whether it's biometric, uh, retina scan, fingerprints, uh, I think what's fascinating to me about digital ID is whenever the physical and these lower tech aspects are uh, brought into it. So it isn't just if you have all the latest tech and and, and, and you're very advanced in that area, but, but it's actually very inclusive. And so that's one element I wanted to make sure we also brought into the discussion that if we're going to have an you know, inclusive world uh, and, and join and interoperable, there needs to be that access to maybe people who don't have all the same uh, tools at their disposal. And so maybe that's one of the um, uh, uh, topics we can get into now and challenge. Uh, Santiago, you mentioned interoperability being the biggest challenge and how the EU is great physically, uh, but, but not so much on digital. Can you, you uh, highlight maybe one area uh, on interoperability, on how it's a challenge and maybe some progress that's being made? Well, there, there is a, a, an obvious uh, area that is uh, the cross-border use of, of digital ID, where, where there is basically no interoperability or very little. No? But also, I mean, even in, in, the, even in the domestic sphere, uh, the uh bank id as compared to the digital id that you use in dealing with the big techs or the government all these are normally uh fragmented and uh, there are some linkages now uh, for instance between between banks and and uh and big tech, so for instance, facial recognition in the in the in the iPhone could be used for, for payments or even to access to, to account. You know? And this is the type of interoperability I think we should aim at, you know? to make sure that we have the best uh, system, the strongest systems, the 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 the, the most protected uh, in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, security, that can be used. Uh, in different contexts and in dealing with different parties, not it would be this would be the the ideal. So we have, for instance, in the banking uh, sphere, very strong uh, authentication systems and uh, uh, that could be used for other purposes. No? And, and, and uh, this is something that we would also maybe uh, deal with uh, later. Uh, but this is this this these are the examples that that come to my mind. Got it. Thank you. And Cheyenne, you, you gave such great examples of how it's being used. Are there challenges in China? And uh, maybe you could share one or two. Uh, I think there are two main challenges in China. Um, so I give an example on health code. And I, I talked about that is used by local government. For instance, the one I'm using is from Beijing. And then so, but uh, whenever I uh, take a flight from Beijing to Shanghai, for instance, Shanghai has its own house code. So I will have to download another app. Um, but in other provinces like uh, Jiangsu province, they will say, okay, we take the Beijing version of house code that's acceptable here in Jiangsu, but Shanghai does not. And especially if you go inland, the, the further you go, 
they uh, they would have more uh, different house calls. So, so I think the first challenge in China is people, if you are traveling across like 30 provinces, you will probably have a 20 house call system on your, on your uh, mobile phone. And the second challenge, well, I think a very strong central, you know, centralization would help to reduce this repetitive on this. Now, the second uh, challenge is the health codes again, or enterprise codes we're using in China. Um, they are used in China. They're based on the Chinese, you know, citizen ID as well as the Chinese mobile phone number. So if you're going outside of the country, and suppose you're traveling to India, right? So how do we make sure that, you know, the digital ID which is unique for individual, hopefully, how can that be accepted in another country? So I think that's, you know, given that we are living in a globalized economy, right? I think it's going to be very beneficial if the whole world accepts the digital ID to one standard, but that is going to be hard and needs a lot of cooperations among governments, organizations, and so on and so forth, yeah. Yeah, I get some implication toward does the financial system have a responsibility because they are already kind of do cross you know settlements like yeah. that, or is it government? Yeah, uh, Marcos, what, 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 I've heard you uh, in some of your previous speaking as well as uh, writings talk about standards as a challenge. Could you elaborate? Um, absolutely, and I think standards as far as this ID goes or any of the certification infrastructure uh, really can be used to deal with a lot of the problems that we see around interoperability. You know, because it's not just the technical standards that will allow further integration, like, for example, API standardization, right? It's a tool that helps two systems talk to another. And so if it's standardized, it gives more leverage for innovation and external development. But it's also the data standard aspect um, and even the reference, the reference data standard, um, you know, the unique kind of identifier uh, standardization aspect that is also quite important and we have seen a lot of uh, solutions trying trying to uh, to deal with these issues um, I mean you know think about for example the context of Swift and the journey they have done um, throughout the years in, in trying to implement standards that are acceptable uh, globally as far as, as as it's possible of course for international payments right so and, and think about the big code which kind of originated from swift as well as an innovation to identify separately different banks and then of course there's um you know the, the next generation of unique identifiers in the financial services sector um but more recently also you know there's there's been other initiatives that are trying to to deal with um interoperability issues uh and you know wide acceptance issues uh, through standardization and, for example, in other cases, the legal entity identifier from the Global LAR Foundation. So that's another kind of initiative that tries to create a standard not only for the unique identifier, obviously, but also for the reference data. You know, what is it to be included? What kind of data need to be included as part of this standard that would be widely, again, acceptable and potentially um, coin this particular standard uh, or identification infrastructure as widely acceptable as many, in as many countries as possible, thus kind of providing further interoperability. So definitely there are standards in creating interoperability, but also encouraging more innovation and democratizing certain uh, products that base the solutions on, on some of these um, uh, EIDs, for example, it's, it's quite crucial. And the second kind of challenge that I'd love to bring into the, the picture and also a big part of our research, but also mentioned um, a couple of times before in this session, is also the data quality. So there must be kind of an agreed way of dealing with data quality. And, and we often see that, for example, disagreement about the use of a particular standard is not or or a ID is not necessarily some of the you know unique identifiers or even the data within, but it's disagreement on how we handle cases about data quality in that particular infrastructure. So then there must be a process, there must be a way to deal with quality of data. So so the database, the the this infrastructure, you know, this identification infrastructure needs to be trusted by everybody, 
if somebody has objections of whether data quality is solid in a particular infrastructure, that that quickly creates a negative externality that makes potentially in the in the future um, the infrastructure um, useless essentially. So standards and data quality, I think that probably the two biggest challenges, uh, obviously, you know, along the lines of Shine and, and Santiago's comments as well around interoperability. But yeah, I think these these would be a couple of very important things that need to be dealt with. Well, we looked at the origin, looked at defining some challenges. I think we need to take a section here also and dive into maybe implementation or, or what, what could someone do about this? You know, what are some steps that are being taken? Um, we haven't really talked about cybersecurity so much. Um, Santiago, could you talk perhaps about maybe some of the more technical aspects that underpin these these um, policy discussions we've been having? Well, as you know, we, we, we in banks are very uh, concerned and I would say obsessed with, with cybersecurity. You know? And that's why also I think we can also contribute to a strong digital ID. So banks have several features that make them a very suitable uh, providers of, of digital ID. They have a huge amount of personal data. They have a long experience in, in digital ID and validating IDs. They have this strong customer authentication procedures related to the Know Your Customer and AML related uh, regulations. So they are required to, to do it uh, very, uh, I mean, with a lot of, of security. They have a, a lot of experience on, on, on cyber security and, and they also are now uh, introducing in the last few years uh, digital onboarding uh, procedures. And banks are, are trusted. Well, banks may, may not be very popular in, in many uh, respects in some, uh, in some countries, uh, but they are trusted in managing money because they, they have the thing they, they, they know how to do and uh, they are subject to a strong regulation and compliance and uh, and some regulations actually imply that banks are already acting as providers of digital id for third parties i mentioned the payment systems directive in europe the psd2 implies banks are providing digital id for the so-called third party providers now this is a regulation that was aiming at introducing competition and, and banks are uh, facilitating this this uh, this service. So, but thing is, banks see themselves as relying parties on the digital ID ecosystem rather than digital ID providers. And this is a certain, it requires a certain jump, but, but this is changing and we are seeing some experiences here and the, the, the Nordics, uh, for instance, in Europe is a very interesting case. Now we have, uh, uh, they, they have a system that is used by the public, by the government, by, by companies with 80% of the adult population having a digital uh, ID as compared to something like 20% in Germany and even less in countries like Spain or the, or the, the UK. The system is based on a collaborative solution, uh, profiting from banks, uh, a strong customer authentication that is cross-border and cross-sector because it covers the four uh, Nordic countries, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Finland, uh, and Norway. But for instance, the results are spectacular. I mean, for instance, uh, now 100% uh, of mortgages are paperless in, 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 in Sweden. Uh, Sweden started the road, then Denmark and the rest followed. It is interesting that they have different solutions, but interoperable. Again, this is the, the key. Now, you, you can have different things, but, but make sure that they can talk to each other. And the key to, to, to success, well, basically, I was mentioned six things. Now, the collaboration between banks, but also banks with government, companies, etc. The volume, I mean, they, they, they reach a critical mass and once, once you reach this critical mass, there is a self-reinforcing uh, kind of uh, virtuous uh, circle. The facility of access, the trust, all this is based on, on, on trust as, uh, and the uh, people in, in, in these societies trust the, 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 the banks for this job. Commitment and the use of a state-of-the-art uh, 
technology. And all these, I think, are keys for, for success. In other areas, including Spain, banks are working on uh, digital ID solutions, for instance, in our case, based on the instant payments platform that was developed by, by, by banks. There are many, many things that are happening. There is the European Payments Initiative by a group of banks that are also working on, on, a, on a platform that may facilitate also digital identity. But there are concerns, and let me finish here. I mean, there are concerns related to, for instance, who is responsible if something goes wrong? What liability uh, questions? Cybersecurity, identity theft, risk to the bank's reputation that may, mm -hmm. may, may arise as a result of this, and even the very cost of the new ID system. So there are things here that need to be addressed but many things are happening and I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we will see uh, mm -hmm. a lot of initiatives that uh, hopefully may talk to each other. Excellent. And Xiao Yang, maybe you could take a minute or two and talk about, especially you think about China, about the supply chain uh, and, and, and perhaps cross-border, maybe in the role of blockchain and things like that. You know, in China, um, you know, we are trying to build um, digital economy as you know, for the nation's whole, you know, next, I don't know how many years, the digital, digital economy is the nation's direction. So for that case, right, for a lot of the economic activities, um, Jeffy just mentioned the supply chain, that would be one link over there, right? From suppliers, you know, from the resources to the suppliers, to the firm, to the banks, you know, to the technology companies, we're hoping to build this, you know, whole penetrating ecosystem. Uh, the government providing the infrastructure, and then we have firms, individuals in the middle, and then we have financial firms and technology firms serving as intermediaries to facilitate all the activities within this ecosystem. But all of that will need some, you know, verifiable unique identification so that goes back that goes back to our original yeah. discussion this is the infrastructure you know it's not only about supply chains about every economic activity in the whole system now in china i think i mentioned this a little bit earlier that a lot of local governments i mentioned in Zhejiang province there is also you know a Sichuan province as well as many other places you know you might be surprised it's like the united states you have many different states and here we have many different provinces that are competing for their technology uh, innovations and economic growth so a lot of those local government platforms they are already trying to attract the whole supply chain to their location so if the government is very efficient they will be able to Form. Uh, for instance, if I'm in the uh, car making business, I want my province to have an edge on car making. So I would start from the resources, right? The steel works and the rubber and the chips and the workers, everything. I would just put all together on the same platform. And, and also I would give, you know, favorable financing um, conditions to those firms. And how can I do that? Well, again, digital ID, I know which firms I want to sponsor more, right? And then that information will be directly passed on to the huge banks. So I don't think whether that answers your question, but again, I circle back to the original discussion is uh, infrastructure. And I think the, well, at least in China, the government, the uh, enterprises and individuals, they're already enjoying some part of, you know, the digital economy brought by the digital ID. So I'm just hoping in the future it will become even better. I think you answered it and beyond because you <laughs> took the answer and you gave an ecosystem approach or answer to an infrastructure uh, concept. So, so thank you for, for linking those two. And, and sure. just you can take one minute. Uh, uh, Marcos, and maybe you could add your your piece and how can this thing be built and built to last? I, th I think execution is always a problem, isn't it? Um, mm. It's there's certainly a lot of progress. I think just to say here, the role of regulation could be quite pivotal. 
uh, when when the markets are not um, necessarily driven as much or incentivized as much from the current structure and economics incentives in place, regulators can also step up and create, um, uh, you know, the conditions, but also the laws that will push for the implementation of some of these, um, um, you know, uh, issues and, and tackle some of these challenges that we've, we've discussed so far. Uh, so regulation is one. Then um, I think also technology, obviously, uh, and Shayan mentioned this quite extensively for the use through the, through the use of blockchain, for example. Um, absolutely, new technologies should be leveraged. Um, we we have a lot of standardization around um, you know authentication technologies, for example. We have a lot of new new standardization kind of initiatives within finance services as well around the APIs that can help very much in transferring and mobilizing identity data. So I think between technology and regulation, I'm quite hopeful that we'll see um, a lot of progress in the future um, and tackling a lot of the issues that we discussed so far. Um, so, but yeah, as Shayan said, I'm also hopeful that things will develop a bit quicker in the next few years. Tech for good and governance knowing their customer. It's a nice way to end on a uplifting note. But there's one more uh, topic I wanted to bring up. I wanted to bring Mohit Joshi into this discussion because in some respects, he launched much of this with his seminal paper on the need for a global digital ID as part of the World Economic Forum. And so, Mohit, I'd like to turn it over to you and perhaps you could t tie this together. Thank you, Jeff. I think it's been, uh, you know, it's been wonderful uh, listening to all of you talk about a topic which is really uh, even more vital today than it ever was in the aftermath of the pandemic. I think we're going to see an explosive opportunity for economic growth. And I think digital identity will help uh, underpin it. Uh, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit of a story. I was speaking with the venture capital friend of mine uh, a couple of months back, and, you know, she's very focused on the digital identity space. And she was talking about the origin of identity. And if you think about it, in 1414, so almost uh, you know 607 years ago, was the first sort of uh, tangible proof that we have of passports being issued. So right here in the UK, in London, uh, during the reign of Henry V, was the first time that safe conduct uh, documents, which later became passports, uh, were issued. And the purpose was safe conduct, but also because so many of them were handed out to traders that resulted in significant prosperity for the country. So in a sense, uh, you know, uh, the topic of identity that we're talking about is somewhat related to developments that happened way back in 1414. And if we think of everything that was discussed today, you know, we spoke about the policy implications, we spoke about the technology implications. Uh, the three themes that really stood out for me was first that the digital identity needs to be simple. We already have a fairly significant digital divide in the world. We need to make sure that it is something which is simple for people to use. Uh, it needs to be universal, uh, universal both in terms of being global and being uh, universal in the sense of going across through SMEs, through large corporates and individuals. And it needs to be safe, safe from a cybersecurity perspective and safe from a you know from an individual privacy perspective as well. So thank you all again. It's a wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm so glad I got a chance to uh, listen in and uh, absorb. Back to you, Jeff. Great. And just to pull it together uh, as we're nearing the end of the hour, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, the only downside here is we can't go into more detail and more topics. We certainly, though, if um, you go to emphasis.com slash IKI, the Knowledge Institute, we're going to share a lot of the information coming out of this. Uh, we'll share, obviously, the video and things like that. And hopefully it's the beginning of a dialogue because this topic is so important that you just continue to build on it. So again, thanks to our panelists. Thank you for your time and your energy and your insights. Thanks to all of you for joining. And until next time, keep learning and keep sharing.